Afternoon. It's always embarrassing when people read your resume to you. Um, it's a whole lot easier to say, just collect my LinkedIn. It'll all work out. Um, hi, my name is Alan Meinwand. I'm CTO at Webflow. I'm here to talk to you about something a little less technical, but maybe equally as important, and that is how do you motivate engineering teams in times of uncertainty? Because I think we're kind of in uncertain times. Um, I'm going to do 30 seconds on what is Webflow, in case you don't know. Uh, Webflow is a web hosting platform. We people do, help people do visual design. Been around for 10 years. We have a bunch of customers. Some of you are in the room. Those of you that I've met today, thank you so much for using our product. Uh, we manage about 2.2 million websites across the planet. Um, a lot of partners, a lot of big names, a lot of good stuff. Um, we basically are about visual design and visual code. So we want to bring development superpowers to everyone. And that basically means that it's important for us to be able to build a platform that allows anyone to be able to build, publish, and make their site on the web. That's enough about that. So uncertain times indeed. Um, we're all going through a bunch of layoffs. There's a lot of people that have sort of seen their jobs change over the past six, eight, 10 months, maybe a year or so. Um, there's been lots of people talking about how we're in a downturn. And I imagine that your teams are sort of thinking to themselves, am I next? And I imagine that they're trying to figure out how to navigate through this. Now, the good news is, um, what I found is that for really, really great talent, even if they're laid off, even if they switch jobs, they're able to find another role pretty, pretty quickly. So there's kind of this interesting conundrum going on. One is there's a bunch of layoffs going on in tech, and two, I don't know if all you feel this way, but I feel this way. Um, it's really important to hang on to our best people because we know if they go on the market, they're gone. There's somebody else very, very quickly. So anybody remember Sequoia's 2008 RMP, RIP Good Times memo? Uh, if you haven't read that, go read it. Read it. It's pretty salient even today. And I think that we are sort of in that state of trying to figure out, are we sort of at the end of the good times or the beginning of the good times. And that adds a lot of uncertainty into engineering teams, a lot of uncertainty into how people think about building engineering teams. So I'm going to give you a couple things that I think about that either will um, make you say, hmm, that's a good idea, or make you say, that's wrong. So let's see what we do. So how do we feel motivation with engineering teams? I think it really boils down to three things. And when I think about the best teams that I've built. And I've worked on teams of five engineers, 50 engineers, 500 engineers, 5,000 engineers. I've been fortunate enough to lead teams of all those scales and sizes, lots of different orders of magnitude in there. And when I think about what those teams have always wanted, they've always sort of wanted three things. They've wanted to work at scale. And I'll describe what that means in a little bit. The best folks I know want to ship to prod, like right away. And they want to work in a professional environment that gives them lots of career growth. So let's dive into each of these. I think each of these points, if you can nail it, will make sure that your teams are motivated, even in these very, very uncertain times. So what does work at scale really mean? Well, in certain cases, people want to work on big infrastructure. They want to work on cloud. They want to work on large uh, chipsets. They want to work on really sophisticated infrastructure. Or maybe they want to build really complicated algorithms. Like the scale of the algorithm you're working on is super important, or the scale of the common networks you're doing is really important. Or maybe they're trying to have a global impact. I've worked in my, earlier in my career, um, I worked at Cisco Systems when it was smaller than this room. And at the time, we were building what we called the internet back in the day. And that was like global impact. It was the ability to build something that we thought could like really change the way we did all sorts of things uh, across the planet. And sometimes people really want to solve things and work at scale by working in a very large community. We have a large community at Webflow. We had a large community at Shopify. Um, Zynga Games had a, had a big community of gamers. But I think there's, there's something about working at scale. And I think if you can sell to your teams that coming to this role, staying in this job, being part of this team means you have an impact at scale is vitally important to fueling their, their motivation. So that's step one. Best people, motivating people, you want to work at scale. Second thing is, I think people want to get code into prod quick. Um, I am sure, I'm sorry, I'm going to offend somebody here. Uh, I am sure that there are teams, 
working for our government and science labs and things like that, they go off into a dark corner for three, four, eight, ten years and build something and walk out and like lights shine and the heavens open and things happen and they ship this thing to, to, to production and it's, it's awesome after years and years and years. Um, that's not the teams I've worked with. The teams I've worked with that really are motivated like to get things out to prod quickly. And what that means is thinking about from the day they show up, how quickly do they do their ship, ship their first PR? I've worked on a couple different companies now where like, you're within the first week, you're shipping a PR to production. Sometimes even the first day or the second day. That really motivates people. I can get in here and I can make a change. I'm not intimidated by the mechanics and the machinery and the tooling and the everything else that goes in with software development. So we tend to think about what does it take to get in the door, sitting in a laptop browser, dev environment of some sort, getting into your code repo, doing a checkout, going into build, writing a line of code, even if it's just a simple test, it's a return true, whatever it is, then getting it through CI, through CD, into prod, and seeing it into production. That entire cycle time, optimizing that. One thing that I've done a lot throughout my career is really optimize that cycle time and find out where the long poles in the tent are in the organization. Is it getting the development environment up and running? Do your developers show up and they spend like days or weeks trying to figure out how the hell to configure this environment. That's probably not a great thing. Or do they come in right away, they're in GitHub, they're in the code, they're building a branch, they're immediately pushing into CI, it goes off to build kite, ships it out to S3 bucket and loaded into prod within minutes. Is that sort of environment that you want to see people in? But I think having that environment from you know, start to prod or from epic to production PR is something that's really, really important to focus on. And focusing on that cycle time and really understanding what that means. What does it mean to get in the build environment? What does it mean to push out something through CI? What does it mean to get it deployed? Am I doing a percentage-based rollout? Do I roll out automatically? All those things are super important because they're really fuel the motivation of engineers. I think the best engineers, again, they want to ship to prod. And then the last thing I'd say is that people want to you know, have a professional environment. This is you know, kind of the, you know, no assholes rule, but I couldn't put that on a slide, so I had to, like, say it out loud. But it's kind of the don't tolerate, I guess we say belligerent jerks these days, whatever you want to use. But what I'm really trying to say is what I think the best people want is they don't want to tolerate bad behavior. They don't want to carry the load for their entire team. They want opportunities to grow. They want to be mentored. They want to be part of a an environment where there is a staff engineer, a principal engineer, or someone up the chain from them that they can learn from, that they can understand the environment and be more impactful. They're looking for career advancements. So I think if you think about building a team, fueling that motivation on three, three levels. Introduce the team and say you're going to be able to work at scale. Think about you're going to have an impact and be able to ship to prod. And honestly, you're just going to work with professional people who aren't going to like treat you badly and aren't going to be in a hostile sort of environment of some sort. And you can live up to those cultural values and bring that to the forefront and make that something that people want to live for and live by and drive into their environment. Then I think you can really fuel the best engineers, even in an environment where their best friends are being laid off and they're hearing all these bad news and they're reading TechCrunch and they go to Reddit and it's all dark and all sorts of things. So we have to think about those environments and how we actually do that. Now. With all that, of course, we got to do more with less. I haven't heard that this, this afternoon. Got to do, do more with less. Got to do more with less. Well, that doesn't mean like just type faster. Sometimes people think that, like, OK, I just got to go faster. Just got to type faster. Like, that doesn't work. And probably that equals more bugs into PRs and code, codes into prod than we'd like. So there's this um, sort of mantra I've taken throughout my career. I learned um, earlier in my career back at ServiceNow about how you actually do more with less. And this is a very funny um, set of three things I'm going to show you. It's even more funny doing it in front of a set of engineering leaders, and I'll, I'll explain why. So here's how you do more. And I'm, I'm waiting for the reaction and the tomatoes and things like that, because it, it's, it's going to be a little weird. Um, number one, I want every single dev team every day to wake up and say, do I have any customer issues I need to fix? This isn't like the entire bug backlog. This isn't every P4 in, Git, in Jira. This is like P0, P1, customer down sorts of things. The second thing I want engineering teams to do after they've thought through, nope, I got nothing that's breaking things right now. I want them to think, how do I make sure that thing doesn't happen again? 
And this is the post-incident action items. So if something has occurred, how do I avoid tech debt in the future? And the third thing I want engineering teams to do, and this is where I usually get booed off the stage, is then build really innovative product. But let's think about what engineering teams do by default. You wake up, and what's the first thing you do? Well, I'll say it together, we build product, right? First thing we do, what's in my JIRA? What's in my current epic? What's in my current story? What's my current feature? What am I doing? And then what happens? An incident occurs, and all good teams, they do the right thing. They'll probably drop what they're working on in the features. They'll go over here and they'll firefight, like call the diving catch. They'll go over here and they'll do something to fix the incident. And what do they do the very next moment? Right back to the product, right? So what they generally tend up doing is end up doing number three. They innovate fast. They'll go up and they'll do number one when they have to. And they'll completely miss the second piece. And they'll basically let tech debt build up. And then what happens? Now play this forward three months, six months, nine months later, you have the engineering managers and the directors coming to you and saying, I have so much tech debt, I have so many incidents to deal with, I'm being interrupted, I can't get in flow time, I can't get my product out the door, I can't innovate fast enough. And I say, yeah, you're doing it wrong. You're doing three, one, two. You're not doing one, two, three. So let's talk a little bit more tactically about how to do this. Um, when I talk about tracking customer issues, I have a dashboard, I've done it in the last four companies I'm involved in. I literally track every, you know, SEV1, P0, P1, whatever you want to call it, whatever the rating is, you want to call it, whatever the most important customer issues are every single day. So I've got a Confluence Jira dashboard up. Every morning I bring it up. What are my P0s and P1s that we happen to have at Webflow? Which are the ones that are currently in progress? Which ones are still to do? Which ones haven't been prioritized? Which ones no one's picked up yet? And then how do I start go bugging those engineering managers and getting to work on what they need to work on? Because if you don't fix the customer issues fast, customers are going to be calling, sales are going to be beating on your head, products are going to be saying, go build more product, but you've got a customer issue to deal with right now. So I'd encourage you all to keep people motivated by making sure you can track your most important incidents at the top of the list every single day. I know it sounds really boring, because guess what? That's not what we get paid to do in engineering. We get paid to write product, but trust me. It'll get better. The second thing you want to do is you want to make sure you trust these post-incident action items. So we classify these in five categories. There's five categories of, of incident action items that I think about. Um, and, and generally, for every incident I've ever been involved in, and trust me, I've caused a lot and I've been involved in a lot, it's, it's one of these five things. It's people, some human made a mistake, happens. Right? We have gray matter, by definition, we're going to make mistakes. Uh, it's process, like there's a process problem, an automation screwed something up, a manual process resulted in additives of some sort. It's technology, like we got a bug, our bug, third party bug, somewhere. It's communication, we didn't communicate well to ourselves or the customer, or internally, or it was a monitoring miss. So every single incident I've ever been involved in, it's people, process, communication, technology, and monitoring. One of those five. So if you think about those five sort of swim lanes, and then for every incident I've ever got, what do I need to fix in each of those five swim lanes, and then track those over time, set SLAs on them, you're gonna make sure that you don't cause the same incident again. But I hope you don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying incidents aren't gonna happen, we can prevent all incidents, that's, that's insanity. Um, what I am here to tell you though is, you don't want the same one to happen again, right? That's the problem, right? It's the, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get to that later. And then you live the pothole in the middle of the road, drive right over it, happens again. Okay, that's what you want to avoid. And then the last thing you want to do is track deliverables and build amazing products. So I happen to be, like probably a lot of you are, so I've got OKR, space metrics, door metrics sort of person. So thinking through how to actually track those deliverables and, and keep those driving forward. So how do you do more? You fix customer issues fast, track them every single day. And a good day, there's none. And guess what? You take about five seconds, you go, yep, none there, next. That's the end of it. You make sure that don't happen again. You go through your incident remediation action items on people, process, communication, technology, monitoring. On good days, nothing there. Great, move on. And then you go build product. And what's amazing is if you get in this habit, if you get in this pattern, then you really quickly get through one and two. 
Because guess what? You're not leaving all that tech debt around. You're not having that incident occur again. You're not having to go to the engineering leaders and go, are you on that, Jira? Have you fixed that? Have you resolved that issue? Are you, are, you, are you working on it? Because they're already on it, and it's done. And what that does is it leaves more room for innovation. So what I found is that this pattern, this, this way of thinking, allows you to keep people motivated and let them keep going, even in your environment where things are scaling fast, things are blowing up, incidents occurring, and we got to innovate and build great product. So how do you fuel engineers' motivation? I think it's all about telling people about you're building at scale, they're shipping to prod, and they're going to work with a great team. And how do you get them to do more with less? You follow that mantra I just said. Because you'll be able to build an environment that allows people to innovate without always this constant interruption. And you'll end up building a very virtual cycle amongst your teams. And I think that's the type of culture and that's the sort of process and that's the sort of environment you can build that even in the times of layoffs, even in the times of uncertainty, even in the times of when your competitors are trying to poach your best engineers, because we all are, um, you can actually have a really healthy team and a really rich engineering environment that will grow and be successful for your company. That's it. Nice to see you all. <laughs>